In this video, I will talk about a few miscellaneous topics uh, that I intend to cover uh, as far as uh, Pinto's user prog is concerned. Um, so what we did um, when we did our live programming session is we looked at um, lo we looked at a bunch of uh, bunch of uh, imp important uh, things that ne are needed in order to get uh, the first test case working. We we looked at the syscall um, interface, um, uh, both in terms of the syscall.c and um, and how how the user programs make calls into the operating system uh, by a, uh, by a syscall a generic syscall with a syscall number followed by a variable number of arguments and uh, what happens uh, in response is we enter into the operating system and inside the operating system there is a syscall handler that is run and the syscall handler uh, receives a frame pointer this is called a frame pointer um, it's the interrupt frame pointer and what it has is the context so what has happened uh, what has been done by the library when we when this call was made before it the transition is made this is actually a a trap call into the operating system but the way a trap being a software interrupt if you will so but the trap puts everything that it needs the arguments are all put on the stack and the top of the stack is going to have your syscall uh, number the call number and the rest of the arguments are uh, are put there and the interrupt frame has a fesp which points to that so you can grab things off of it so that's what the, where f is the interrupt frame so that's what we know we also know uh, how how to uh, how process create works uh, we know how uh, process exit and process exit and process wait have to uh, have to work together um, we saw uh, specifically we saw how uh, setup stack is responsible for launching a program uh, so we said we saw all these but the missing pieces uh, are the missing pieces that I was uh, uh, that are not as significant but need to be covered are one the first missing piece is uh, is um, our uh, file descriptor table Uh, the second piece is error checking and the third um, we'll, we'll revisit the synchronization uh, uh, the the uh, this process exit process wait needs to really a two need to be a two-phase uh, process and we'll see why it has to be a two-phase process um, so so let's let's start with the file descriptor table so we know from um, from doing our yash la t lab that uh, there is a per process file descriptor table and we also when i described this i said that uh, within the within each pcb which is a per process process control block uh, this is in Unix, any variant of Unix. We, say, we saw that within this PCB, uh, besides a PID and some sort of a status and stuff like that, uh, we have a file descriptor table. And this table is, is organized such that the index into this table, the index is a file descriptor. And the contents of this table are, are the contents are, are file pointers. 
Uh, in fact, there could be uh, the way Unix does this, it, there could be file or there could be any device pointers because all even devices are accessed in Unix using the notion of a file descriptor. That is, you open the device, you when you open the device, you get a file descriptor, and when you talk to the device, whether you read from the device or write to the device, you'll simply be using the file descriptor as your handle into it. The operating system makes the necessary um, necessary calls internally because it doesn't want you to have to worry about the device specific implementation. So. So what we what, what we are going to have to do in in Pintos then is we need to find a place for this. Um, for us, that will be inside our thread control block, which is our struct thread. And um, so inside our struct thread, we will have to add a file descriptor table, um, file descriptor table inside our struct thread. And so the question is what data structure to use. We could, um, the simple simple answer to that is you could just make it an array of struct file types. Uh, because in this lab, we will not use anything other than struct files. Uh, so we could just make it an array of struct files. Alternatively, you could make, a, make it a list uh, because there's a list implementation. Um, so alternatively, you can make it a list uh, or you can even make it a hash table. And I have uh, I have uh, demos of both of these. Uh, but uh, to keep it simple, I would suggest just using an array of struct uh, file. But the question is how big to make it? What size should this array be? And um, I would say you can take a conservative bet and start with something like uh, um, 20 entries in here and see if that works. If it doesn't work, then you can up it up. Doesn't work as in if you start failing test cases because there are more files, then up it up. So um, let's just say there are 20 of those. Uh, the, the thing about this file descriptor table though, like in Unix is that the first three entries, entry zero, one, and two um, in this table are are like in Unix, they are this std in, standard in, this std out, and the std error. So this is where our first file, new file descriptor, uh, file descriptors will start. So, uh, so we we saw that uh, when we when we open a file, what we're getting is we're going to be looking for the first entry. So my suggestion is for you to um, keep track of besides besides you know the length of the table, but keep track of some sort of a some sort of an entry within the struct um, within the struct. Um, keep track of, for example, I would say keep track of a max FD. Uh, so another variable besides a file descriptor table keep track of a max fd and max fd will be initialized to initial value of this will be let's say three and which means that that's the next or you can also call it next fd maybe we'll call it the next fd um, next file descriptor so every time there's a request to open a file you go you start using that entry and then you increment it on so you increment on on new file open and uh, and then you can keep incrementing it if you want to if you want to be very very conservative with your uh, with your file table you can decrement it on on uh, file deletion um, file sorry file close not deletion uh, this should be you should do this carefully because uh, because decrementing it doesn't always doesn't always work because you could have three files open and the third file is closed uh, and the other two files are open. So if you decrement it, decrement it um, in that particular case, it will work because because it will just go back to the last file you open. But what if I closed a file that is uh, I opened file A, B and C. So if I open, let's say A, 
b and c and what if i close this one then if you if you decrement the file file descriptor ne the next fd is currently pointing here this is the next fd if it is here and you close this one if you decrement it you're in trouble so i'll let you figure out how you're going to manage that but the basic idea is you'll keep track of the next fd uh, in fact uh, some some students have implemented in the past uh, this data structure by simply saying if something is closed i'm not even going to bother i'm just going to keep uh, keep that empty and i keep going and if I run out of file descriptors, then I'll go in and move and, and go in and start using the ones that have uh, been closed because I'll put some dummy value there, uh, maybe a null value there, and then I can go use it. So that's our file descriptor table. So the second thing that we need to worry about is error checking. Um, so this brings us to, uh, um, so, so what we mean by error checking is when when users make syscalls syscalls pass uh, sometimes pass pointers to the os now it's perfectly possible that one of these pointers is in uh, is invalid so the it's the responsibility of the os needs to to check these pointers. Now, there are two approach, approaches you can take. Uh, the simple check, for example, needs to check these pointers, and null check is an easy check. Null is easy, right? Uh, because all you have to do is check if it is null. But the more harder ones are invalid pointers. Now, to do an invalid check can be you can take two approaches, um, A and approach B. Approach B is do a complete check of what it means to be quote unquote invalid. Now there might be so many different things. For a simple example is you could say if if you generate a pointer and this is your fizz base right here if you generate a point if you give me a pointer that is anywhere outside of my virtual address space all these are valid and anything you generate if it is outside of this then it's invalid so i can i can do that now there can also be things like what if you generate an ad, uh, generate an address uh, for reading um, for writing to that is not supposed to be written to. So that gets complicated because it's possible that you have code, heap, and stack, and you're not supposed to modify this. R writing to this is invalid. Writing is invalid. Now, how do I change that? I don't want to have to check it. So option A, while, while it is the right thing to do, it is it tends to be very hard because you have to consider all possible scenarios. The, the option that most, most operating systems implement is actually option B. Option B is, is to access given pointer and see if a fault occurs. And report back. Now, this is this is we're not we're not checking whether it's valid or invalid. We're going to actually perform the access, and this access could be a read access or a write access. So, so what uh, what you'll see on Pinto's uh, in Pinto's uh, the Stanford site is um, they they provided two routines and let me open a browser and bring it up uh, let me give me a second uh, let's open a browser and get the pintos site pinto stanford and you will see inside your um, 
if you scroll down into it says accessing user memory if you click on this there is uh, there are these two routines that are provided let me walk you through what these two, two routines do what these two routines are allowing you to do and you can just copy these two routines into your code and what these two routines are doing is is they are they are going to do the read or write access so this is this one is reading and this one is writing so whenever whenever for example if i a simple example could be uh, let's say you did a read um, read system call and you said I want to read from file descriptor some file descriptor and you want to read a certain um, read into a buffer some buffer that has been point uh, buffer uh, has been passed to you and some size that you want to read size of how many bytes you want to read this is typically a call that read makes now this buff is actually a some sort of a character star a pointer that has been passed to you so what you can say is, well, I'm going to perform the read for you. So, for example, if the size, let's say, is 100 and you pass me a buffer and the pointer to the buffer, wherever that pointer is. So what you're going to say is I'm going to try and see if I can read all 100 of these locations, whatever you gave me, because I'm going to I'm going to read into those locations. So which means that I'm going to look at whether I can write to write to buff or not because if i can write to it then 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 when i perform the read from the from the disk into that buffer then that that will not fail and i will not have have any issues later on so instead of giving it to the file system and then failing and not knowing why the failure happened you're going to do the sanity check before you call the file sys uh, function that actually does the reading for you so so this 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 function here which happens to be an assembly function will return a error code which will be a minus uh, which will return an error code to you and the error code actually it returns an error the assembly will return an error code but you return a true or false a zero slash one or true slash false um, or false slash true. Uh, similarly, if you have a write system call and you say file descriptor and you have a buffer and you're writing some number of bytes, we're gonna do a we're gonna check whether you can read from that. And and notice I'm 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 doing it backwards because a write from the user means that I want to write to this uh, write to the disk write to disk from buffer which means I should be able to read this buffer so we check if that can be read and and by calling get user and get um, get uh, uh, put user I am able to check whether I can read that many bytes now um, there are some there are some cases uh, that you have to worry about uh, which is if you try to uh, read if you try to read um, uh, this this one only reads one byte at a time it doesn't see it's only reading one byte so the question is if I have a buffer if you give me a pointer to a buffer and let's say this buffer has several locations and and I want you to I, I'm saying it's 100 locations 0 through 99 so do I read each one of these and see whether I can read them or should I can I do some optimization a simple optimization is if you can read the first byte and the last byte, then you should be able to the, read the entire thing. So I would do that simple optimization. Uh, similarly, writing is also the same way. If I can read the first byte and the last byte, then I should be in good shape. Okay. Um, now there are there are other uh, other uh, optimizations one can consider, but that is the simplest one I can think of. Uh, the last the last thing that uh, i talked about is our um is our uh, wait and interaction between wait and exit now uh, in my in my uh, in my programming session uh, let me pull up the code i um, we we came up with um, 
here is a code from the live programming session i will open my um, process.c which was in user prog actually let's see process.c and we we wrote this code and i'll just uh, get to the code that we um, we worked on that is related to our exit and wait so this is the code of exit and wait and let me just copy these two blocks from here oops okay so this is our exit i will just copy this code from here uh, and let's put it here and let's not worry about the chopped off stuff and then let's go back again and this is our our code for the weight uh, oops okay there is our code for weight and, and let's see what we did as far as interaction between these two and why you may have to consider a more uh, some some a case which is not obvious from this uh, so i'll put that guy there uh, let me actually it doesn't matter that i chopped off okay let's actually let's uh, let's put them up and down I'll put this guy down here all right so this is our our interaction between wait and exit and the idea here was that uh, you have a child thread this is uh, this is a this is an exiting thread if you will and this is the waiting thread and the waiting thread will have done a process wait so what we did here in this simple example is we we created a semaphore called an exiting semaphore and this guy does a semi down on this so he does a semi down on it a down or in other words let's just call that a wait he waits on he waits on on exiting which which means that unless unless somebody flags him and the only one that's going to flag him is the exiting thread and this one signals exiting so what will happen in a typical implementation is uh, this guy will come here block and keep waiting till the child program whichever our, whichever process that is that we've created exits and when this one exits and does all his work he's eventually going to do uh, he he will run at some point and he signals and this will unblock it it won't immediately run it'll just go from ex waiting to to ready and then he's gonna get finish his egg his exiting part here and he quits quits ex quits his exit now in this code i did not i did not provide anything re with respect to the return exit status so what happened actually in uh, before process exit was called is you in your in in your uh, thread control block this is the child's thread control block this guy's thread control block he added a, a, a exit status so this one is going to re after he unblocks he's gonna this one writes the exit status and this one reads the exit status here now here's what happens in could happen in a real system now because because the signaling only puts you in ready state but doesn't actually run you here is a scenario that can happen and this is a scenario which we want to account for and the scenario is this you you've written the exit status you flag this guy and you you also at that point you're done so you quit when you quit 
what's going to happen is this thread control block is freed so at some point this guy runs because he's only ready but he didn't run yet when he runs and he tries to access this he tries to read read this this read is going to call a cause a seg fault because it doesn't exist because you you're reading something that has been freed and you have a pointer probably because you kept a pointer in your uh, or or maybe you, you even worse you didn't even keep a pointer maybe you just searched through the list of list of threads for for the thread that is ex that exited um, because there is an all threads list there's an all threads list and you can write a little routine which takes a tid and uh, and uh, returns a struct thread and i would suggest that you write this routine because it's going to come handy where you can just say get thread and what it does is it takes a tid as input and returns a struct thread that corresponds to that particular tid and um, there is the you can modify thread dot uh, you can add it to thread dot c and h and use that uh, as an utility function so let's say you call that function here so you said i want to call um, i know what the tid is because wait has received the tid of the process that wants to quit uh, the post process to wait on and so you're doing a lookup when you do a lookup here this lookup look up for the thread is going to fail because this particular thread has already been freed so here is the solution for that the solution and this is a classic approach that most operating systems take which is called a two phase two phase exit wait process so the two phase process involves uh, the when the when the uh, when the child which let's call this again the exiting thread exiting thread when he comes to the point where he's done more all his work and he does a semi up on the exiting thread exiting uh, semaphore and this one has this is the the parent in the parent could be either the operating system or an actual thread a, 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 a thread that created a child thread so um, so if, if it's a so in the case of argsnan it's the operating system but later on you will see that uh, a process uh, can create other other child uh, processes using exec in which case the parent is not the operating system the parent is the process that created a child thread uh, that's where actually this this uh, the scenario plays out more more um, prominently because the operating system doesn't quit immediately it it uh, the operating system is not even reaping the exit status of the child it's just saying i i'm 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 going to uh, at least in the args nan case i'm a, i'm assuming that the args nan quit normally because exit state is exit statement has been put in the syscall handler and i'm not even reporting and i'm not checking what the exit status is so so now what we're going to do is in your wait this is your wait step this is your exit exit sequence somehow you came from the exit sequence here in your wait sequence you did a semi down on the same exiting Thread. By the way, uh, the side note: uh, this exiting thread should really be in the TCB of the child. Should hold this exiting. You don't want to put it in the parent because the parent has many children, and we are we are saying that I'm I'm really interested in this child. So it should be TCB of the of child should have one semaphore called exiting. This is going to be a struct semaphore inside it so so now um so so it'll be some it'll not be ampersand here but it'll be get the child process and then to uh, access that exiting so you did that and then now what you're going to do is this is only to wake up this guy but he's gonna 
read the exit status from child's PCB but we don't we, to make sure that this doesn't fail he wakes up the parent and then he sleeps on he goes to wait on a done some sort of a done semaphore so he's gonna add another semaphore to his to the to the thread structure which is a done semaphore or you can even let's call it reaped semaphore because it's waiting for the exit status to be reaped so he does uh, on the reaped semaphore so what what the parent is going to do is he's going to read the he's going to uh, wake up he's going to read the exit status and he can be sure that the child hasn't exited because the child is blocked here so he'll wake up and then he'll simply the child will simply block here he blocks at this point the parent will run he will read the exit status he does what he needs to do and then he does a semi up on the reaped exit status so he's he's successfully able to get the exit status and when he does that he will unblock that guy and now he can he can uh, exit his weight without any problem because he's he's uh, he can return he can return the exit status because what that's what he's supposed to do um, exit status um, and he has the right exit status and this guy can can then end his end it and then release the OS will release the uh, or free uh, free the TCB here so this has to be a two-phase uh, exit uh, process uh, weight process um, I uh, this is sometimes also referred to as a two-way handshake I it's not just this way shaking this guy's hand but then this one has to in uh, acknowledge that and then shake the hand this is a two-way handshake if you will so uh, I hope these uh, uh, miscellaneous topics uh, will help uh, coverage will help you wrap up uh, I have office hours again uh, on Friday I haven't seen many people uh, last week I assume people were busy uh, but I'm happy to walk you through any uh, code related uh, questions you may have